I'll tell you, I feel right at home all this humidity. This is about like Florida this morning. Yeah. Do what? <laughs> well, we just bloom where God plants us, amen. <laughs> Wherever it is. You know, I wouldn't mind having a ministry in the Bahamas or somewhere, but... Uh, <laughs> Amen. Let me uh, clarify something before we move on this morning. I made a statement a couple of days ago about uh, Thomas Nelson Publishers and a couple of people asked about that. What I was referring to, they reprinted um, a, a facsimile of the original publication of King James, 1611. I'm not talking about the, the King James Bibles they print and publish, okay? I'm talking about the facsimile that they made. It's a hardback. And it says on it King James sixteen eleven something like that. That's what I was referring to. If you got a if you got a King James Bible printed by Thomas Nelson, then uh, that's okay. All right. So I'll tell you how to check out some of these guys. Uh, uh, some of these printers, World Printers does this sometimes. Thomas Nelson does it sometimes. If you look in uh, if you look in Acts chapter seven and see if they change the name Jesus to Joshua, then there's other places that they mess with the book and change words. And they didn't tell you about it. If it still says Jesus, then um, at this point in time, it's, it's still okay. It's still got everything else right. But uh, they are messing with some of the King James Bibles without telling you they're doing that. Uh, a, new King, a new Schofield is not a King James Bible. A new Schofield reference Bible is not a King James Bible. It calls itself that, but that's not what it is. They, they've made a lot of changes in that in the text itself. And um, it's, it's a sad thing in our day and time. you just got to... You got to watch Christian publishers for deception, and uh, they claim to be giving you the Bible and give you something else. So you got to be careful about that. Um, let's go to Psalm 11 this morning. I'm I'm not going to preach on the Bible. I'm going to preach from the Bible this morning. Psalm chapter 11. We do have a Correspondence Bible Institute, Gulf Coast Bible Institute, um, to help, um, especially designed for preachers, but anybody, I guess, um, be able to go to Bible school without leaving your home. And um, we're not a diploma mill. If you enroll, you're going to study, you're going to learn the Word of God, and that's what it's all about. We've got some students around here uh, now, Brother Boyd and Brother Mark back here, a couple of a couple of guys that have graduated from us sitting around here. If you want to talk to somebody from a student standpoint, okay, see them and they'll, they'll tell you what they think about it. And um, I haven't primed their pump, so I hope they think the right thing about it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if you haven't been over, there's a lot of good stuff in that tent on all those tables and good Christian books. There's stuff you can find in there if you won't find in a Christian bookstore. Because Christian bookstores are getting more and more charismatic in their stuff that they stock. And uh, so avail yourself of good Christian literature and uh, things that will help you in your Christian walk. Okay, in, Psalm, in Psalms here, uh, Psalm 9 is talking about why David praised the Lord and, and how he praised the Lord. And uh, I know I said chapter 11, we'll get to that. But Psalm 9, verse 1, he said, I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will show forth all thy marvelous works. So it's talking about uh, his praise and his worship and and his joy in the Lord. And then Psalm 10 turns that thing around and gives you the other side of the coin. You're not always praising the Lord in your Christian life. You're not always on the mountaintop. You're not always rejoicing. After the great psalm of victory there in chapter 9, where uh, uh, David is talking about his victory in the Lord, then he comes in chapter 10, verse 1, and says, Why standest thou far off, O Lord? Why hidest thou thyself in times of trouble? You ever been there? Were you in times of trouble? You couldn't find God if you... If you had to, you didn't know where he was at. And from this great victory in chapter 9, and, and uh, David realizing the promises of God and the pardon of God and the praises for God and all that stuff, the very next verse, the very next psalm, he says, Where'd you go, God? What's happened to you? We were having sweet fellowship yesterday, and you're not around today. What's going on? That's all, hey, after all that praise and that singing and that worship and that running aisles and that that's a great feeling and the presence of God. Where are you now? You ever been there? If you haven't, you'll get there, I'll guarantee you. I had a young Christian been saved about a year. One time he told me, uh, 
He said, man, this Christian life, this is it. Ever since the day I got saved, it's been wonderful. I said, just tighten your seatbelt, son. <laughs> it's not going to stay that way. We are living in a sin-cursed world. And because of that, a lot of the crud and stuff from the sin-cursed world is going to hit us every once in a while. And we're going to face problems. And we're going to have trouble looking for God. I mean, at this meeting sometimes this week, you might just get the feeling, everything's so wonderful, I'm just going to shout it out all the way from here to heaven. might not be that way. In fact, you might lose your shout by next week. You don't know what's going to happen. We don't know from one day to the next. The Lord said, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. You don't even know what's going to happen the next day. So, uh, instead of uh, continuing to shout in chapter 10, he finds out God's not always around. At least it seems that way. But that's a part of the Christian life. So, well, God, uh, God, is, God is everywhere. He is doctrinally. But I'm telling you, some of us have been some places He wasn't. As far as we could tell. We couldn't find Him anywhere. And so that's where David was in Psalm 10. He had to learn a lesson. He had to learn the lesson that you go ahead. You do what's right. You continue in the path. You stay right. You live right. Even if you can't find God with a search warrant, you just do what's right. And if you do that, everything in the end will turn out right. Sometimes it might be with you like it was with Hezekiah. Second Chronicles, Hezekiah was a good king. God blessed him tremendously. And in Second Chronicles 32, verse 31, the Bible says God left him to try him that he might know all that was in his heart. I'll tell you the, the time when God left him. The verse brings all that out. It's when the king of Babylon sent those ambassadors down after Hezekiah had been sick to see about Hezekiah. And it was in that time when Hezekiah showed them all his treasures and all the treasures of the house of the Lord and all that. And Isaiah came to him after that and said, Because you showed the enemy of God everything, the enemy of God is going to come in here and take everything from you. It was during that time when those ambassadors came down to talk to Hezekiah. It was during that time that the Bible says God left him to try him to see what all what was in his heart. Right at a critical time, when this, these enemies come in, God backed off. And he said, I'm just going to see what Hezekiah's going to do in this situation. He does us the same way sometimes. Sometimes God just back off to see what we're going to do. God could have stayed with Hezekiah and given Hezekiah the wisdom he needed. And Hezekiah could have said, hey, you guys don't belong here. You just pack up and get back to Babylon where you belong. But he didn't. He backed up to see what Hezekiah was going to do about it. The question is, are you going to serve God no matter what's happening? Are you going to serve God when everything is right? Or are you going to keep serving God when everything's wrong? You know what Jesus said over there in John chapter 6? He had just fed those 5,000 people with the a, with a loaves and fishes. And uh, the next day, His disciples say, Lord, this whole crowd's following us. And Jesus said, they're not following us because of the miracles I do. They're following us because of the loaves. Because I fed them. Because I blessed them. Because I took care of them. And sometimes God, though you are living right, doing everything right, God is not going to bless you. God is not going to do anything good for you. God is just going to back up and see how you're going to react when things don't go your way. And that's where David is in chapter 10. David's wondering why God's blessing the wicked and not the righteous. Psalm 73 is about that. David questions why God is blessing the righteous. Why does your neighbor look like everything's going great for him? He lives like hell and uh, uh, blasphemes God every day of his life and everything's going wonderful for him and your family's falling apart and your finances are falling apart and you wonder what in the world's going on. And it goes down in chapter 73 down to verse 17 and said, David said, when I went to the sanctuary, then understood I therein. You stay right with God when things are not going right. You stay faithful in church as Brother Fisher was talking about last night and eventually you'll understand what's going on. You know what we do? We compare those in church that are just living any way they want to live and it looks like God's blessing them every step of the way. And we look at some Christian family that's just struggling and can't hardly make ends meet and are trying to do right and it seems everything's going wrong with them. And we scratch our heads and say, where in the world? What is God doing? That's why Paul says we're fools when we compare ourselves among ourselves. We don't always know what's going on. Look here in chapter 11. Let's read a few verses. Psalm 11. 
We see that going on. We see people not living right. They seem to be blessed. The people who are living right, they don't seem to be blessed. And we wonder where God's going to. Chapter 11, verse 1. In the Lord put I my trust. How say ye to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? For lo, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow upon the string that they may privily shoot uh, at the upright in heart. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in His holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold. His eyelids try the children of men. The Lord tries the righteous, but the wicked and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. Hey, did you just get that verse? It says, it says there's some people God hates. That's what it says. Chapter 5, verse 5, it says He hates all the workers of iniquity. No, no, God does not love everybody. Amen. Upon the wicked He, God, shall rain snares, fire, and brimstone, and in horrible tempest, this shall be the portion of their cup. For the righteous Lord loveth righteousness. His countenance doth up, uh, behold the upright. Father, thank You for the Word of God. Lord, sometimes we don't know where You are, that's for sure. Things just seem to be falling in and caving in around us. Lord, in our mind, in our heart, uh, we know we know You're around. The Bible teaches that. You never leave us nor forsake us, but Lord, sometimes we can't see You. And God, if we're not real careful, we begin to doubt. We begin to turn away. We begin to stop doing what's right. We begin to say what's for use. We throw in the towel. God, there may be some here that way today. Maybe some been having some real difficulty in life. And Lord, just wonder where in the world you are. God, I pray you'd comfort their hearts today and show them that you're still on the throne. You've still got control of what's going on. Lord, help us to be faithful, found faithful, even when things are not right. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, we needed to see what was going on in Psalm 10 in order to see why David said in the very next verse, chapter 11, verse 1, In the Lord put I my trust. In other words, God, uh, I can't find you in chapter 10, but Lord, I'm going to trust you anyway. I'm going to keep serving you anyway. I'm going to keep doing what's right anyway, even if you're gone. Hey, I'd rather put my trust in an absent God than in the present wicked any day, any day of the week. He said in chapter 2, Lo, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow upon the string that they may simply shoot at the upright in heart. We need to be careful. We don't start trusting this world, trusting the arm of flesh and so forth. When we can't find God, we just need to stay right and do right what God tells us to do, no matter how dark it might get in our life. Are you going to serve God when you're, when you're right? Or are you going to serve God when things are wrong? That's the question. Paul said, uh, instant out of sea, in sea and out of sea. Serve God when the sun's shining, serve Him when it's raining. Serve Him when you're in health, serve Him when you're in sickness. It doesn't matter. Uh, John the Baptist, John the Baptist was serving the Lord. Uh, he was baptizing people by the hundreds down at the Jordan River. And he knew who Jesus was. He said, Behold, the Lamb of God has taken away the sin of the world. And he said, I'm not worthy to unlatch his shoes. He said, He's the one you're, to, you're supposed to follow. This is the Son of God. This is the Messiah. I mean, everything going wonderful for John the Baptist. Then he got arrested. He got put in jail. His ministry suddenly stopped. He's not baptizing anybody. He's not preaching to anybody. He's not looking at the Lamb of God anymore. He's sitting in that jail cell, and everything is gone haywire. His whole ministry is falling in on him. And guess what he did? He took two of his disciples, and he said, You go down unto Jesus, and you ask Him. Are you he that should come, or look we for another? Hey, he knew exactly who Jesus was a few days before. But now everything's falling in. And he says, I'm not sure anymore. I don't know if he's the one anymore or not. That's the way we get sometimes. Preacher, when your church starts falling apart, church splits, people leaving, people getting mad, like Brother Nick said the other night, Brother David said the stupid stuff like what's going on the sign, and you begin to think, where's God? My ministry is falling apart. Your kids start getting rebellious and getting into drugs and stuff, and God forbid that that happen. But kids do things like that, and it happens in your house, and you begin to say, where's God? What's happening here? I've done the best I could. I did everything I was supposed to do. I went by this book, and it's all falling in on me. You begin to wonder where the Lord is. Listen, if God... Now, don't get me wrong. I love God's presence. I like it when He shows up. 
I relish it. I enjoy it. I like to just look around, see everybody shouting and zipping the victory, running the aisles, and, and uh, the, the boy in the, in the wheelchair zipping up and down here. <laughs> that was a thrill, man. I like that. But listen, if God never fellowship with me again, He's done enough already that I ought to stay right with Him, I ought to keep serving Him, I ought to keep worshiping Him. Oh, there you are, brother. I didn't see you. I ought to keep praising Him. I ought to keep faithful to church. I ought to keep training my children right. I ought to keep doing what I'm supposed to do, whether He ever blesses me again or not. Hey, God doesn't have to prove Himself to me. He doesn't have to prove He's God. He proved His love at Calvary. He doesn't ever have to do anything else. We ought to just serve Him anyway. Because He's God. No matter what He's doing for us, no matter what He's not doing for us, if He permanently... Uh, I, I, I appreciate Brother Fisher's message about this place last night. I thank God for this place. I'm going to tell you what, Brother Mark, if God permanently vacates the premises here, you stay right with God anyway. He's still God. He's still worthy to be worshipped and praised. Whether He does anything for me personally or not, He's worthy of all worship and praise and service. David said, In the Lord put I my trust. God, I don't know where you are, chapter 10, verse 1, but I'm putting my trust in you. Anyway. He didn't say, I'm putting my, my trust in your conscious presence, God. He said, I'm just put my trust in you. I mean, I like it when it's like Paul said, a demonstration of God's spirit power. I like God to come to church and demonstrate. <laughs> just show Him prayer. It's wonderful. But it's not, every church is not going to be that way. It's not going to be that way every time. Sometimes you're going to even get in church and, and the song service and the preaching and everything, you're going to sit there and wonder, where's God? Somebody talks about life being a bed of roses. Yeah, if you ever walk through a bed of roses, you better keep your distance. <laughs> a lot of thorns. <laughs> a lot of thorns. Amen. What you got to do, child of God, is make up your mind. That you're going to do right anyway. Doesn't matter what's happened. You're going to trust Him. You're going to serve Him. Whether you experience His presence or not. You're just going to say right. You remember Job? Now, Job thought God did all that stuff to him. All the way through. I mean, he's talking about the Lord doing all this stuff to him. He thought God killed his ten kids. He thought God uh, made his wife estranged to him. He thought God had made him a pauper when he was the wealthiest man in the East. He thought God had taken away his health. But you know what? With all that on his mind, he's talking about it all the way through it. In chapter 3, he said, It's better if I've never been born. I wish I'd never seen the light of day. Uh, he thought God did all that. He gets to chapter 13. He says, Though he slay me, yet... Well, I trust in Him. He's done all this to me. He's even killed me personally. I'm still going to trust Him. That's what God's doing. I mean, you've got to make up your mind to that. You remember those uh, uh, Hebrews got carried off into battle and there's, there's young uh, Daniel, probably about 17, 18 years old. You listen to young people, a teenager. A teenager. And he's a, he's a slave. He's a captive in a foreign land with a foreign culture and a foreign language and a foreign religion and everything is against his God and everything's against his homeland and there he is uh, there he is a young man in the midst of all that you know what he said he said I purpose in my heart I'm not going to defy myself it doesn't matter if the devil got uh, the victory over me it doesn't matter if the devil is destroying everything I got Daniel says I've made a purpose in my heart I'm going to stay right with God and you get on down in there in chapter 6 and you find those three Hebrews and uh, they wouldn't bow down to the golden image and Nebuchadnezzar said, uh, you're going in the fire if you don't. And you know what they said? In, a, in effect, let me paraphrase. They said, we don't know if God's here or not. But we're going to stay right with God anyway. We don't know if He'll be in the furnace with us or not. We don't know if He'll deliver us or not. But we're not concerned about that. All we're concerned about is we're going to stay right with God no matter what He does. And if He doesn't show up, we're going to stay right with God. And guess what happened? Uh, when they got the fire, He showed up. Amen. 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 Stay right with God. He'll show up somewhere in there. <clears throat> He'll come to you. David can't find God. But he says in the Lord, put on my trust. And notice what he went on to say in verse 1. How say ye to my soul? Flee as a bird to your mountain. It sounds like David's talking to himself. It sounds like he's trying to reason to himself here. He says, I'm going to trust in God. Why in the world am I saying to myself, run away from this? 
Find a world myself for myself. I need to get away from all this stuff. I need to flee to the mountains. I need to get away from what's happening here. That's what we say when things go wrong. That's what some of you preachers are going to say when your church starts falling apart. You're going to, you're going to suddenly decide God's called you somewhere else and God hasn't said a word. It's appalling to me that uh, uh, pulpits change pastors an average of every 18 months throughout the country. That's terrible. I heard a man tell me the other day, he said whenever he, uh, he, he'd been saved a couple of years, and when he got to, he came to uh, move to another place and joined the church there and found out that preacher had been there over 20 years, he said, this ain't right. He had the idea that the church was supposed to have a new preacher every two or three years. Hey, man, God did you in somewhere. Build right where you are. If He moves, you're fine, but you better make sure it's Him moving. Hey, little secret, you cannot run from trouble. You can't run from your problems. All you do is drag them along with you and build a complete new set to go with them. It's a lot worse. But sometimes we feel like running away from it all. Aren't you glad Jesus didn't quit? He didn't quit. And he felt just like you do sometimes. Say, oh, you know it's out there because he said, My God, why has thou forsaken me? Where are you, God? He felt just like you do sometimes. But he didn't quit. Thank God for that. So David's doing his best here to stay right with God in the middle of all his troubles. And he can't find God. I want to give you three things here out of this chapter to do when you feel like you ought to quit. You ought to just run away from it all. First of all, refuse to flee. Make up your mind. Just refuse to flee. I ain't a going nowhere. So God tells me. I talked to a man three or four weeks ago. He was, he was really confused. He didn't know what God wanted. And he told me, I think I'll do this. I, I said, you better just sit still, son. You better just sit still till you hear from God. Or you'll wind up making a major mistake with your family. Refuse to flee. I understand from Scripture there's some things we should flee from. There's some things we should run from. You're supposed to flee from temptation. Genesis 39 says, Joseph, another young man, ran out of the house. He fled. He got him out. He said, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? He left so fast that the Bible says he left his coat in there. It's time to flee when temptation and opportunity meet at the same time. You're in trouble if you don't flee. Listen, you can be tempted... But there's no opportunity to fulfill the temptation, and you're fairly saved. You can have opportunity, but you're not tempted. You're fairly saved. But when you're tempted and you've got the opportunity at the same time, you better run. Or you'll find yourself yielding to the temptation. We're supposed to flee fornication, First Corinthians 6, 18. I mean, if immorality is showing up around your corner, run from it. We're supposed to flee idolatry, First Corinthians 10, verse 14. Anything comes between you and God, run from it. Get away from it. We're supposed to flee the love of money. First Timothy 6, verses 10 and 11. That's what gets a lot of preachers. That's what gets a lot of Christians. There's the love of money. You've got to run from that stuff and put God ahead of all that. We're supposed to flee youthful lust. Second Timothy 2, verse 22. You know why he calls it youthful lust? Because every dirty old man used to be a dirty young teenager. Lust starts in youth, and if you don't get control of it in youth, you're not going to have control of it all your life. But those are the kind of things David's not talking about here. He's talking about God is gone and the enemy is abounding, so it's not time to flee. It's not time to run. He said in verse 2, the enemy has their bow being. He said they make ready their arrow upon the string. He said they got it aimed right at the, uh, at the upright in heart. Listen, the wicked, the wicked hate the righteous. Jeremiah said, all my familiars watch for my halting. Saying, per adventure, he shall be enticed. We'll have the victory over him. Uh, all through Psalms, he talks about the wicked looking for your downfall and even plotting your downfall. Your lost neighbor's not in favor of the fact that you're a child of God. Your lost uh, fellow worker on the job's not in favor of the fact that you're a Christian. Uh, they want to see you mess up. But why? Because if you mess up, they don't have to listen to you witness to them. That's why. They don't have to listen to your testimony if you mess up. And that's what they're looking for. And David said, I'm surrounded by that and I can't find God. i got a problem here. It's time to refuse to flee when the enemy rises up against us. God doesn't like deserters. 
He doesn't allow AWOL in his army. And uh, it's a good way to get shot in a hurry. You turn your back and go running from the enemy. It's time to stand when the enemy shows up. Not time to run. We should flee because it'll bring honor and glory to God if we stand. Somebody's already preached this week, God sought for a man to stand in a gap and make up the head. But you know the sad commentary there, he looked through the whole nation of Israel and he ends that verse by saying, But I found none. When the enemy shows up, God's looking for somebody who'll stand up and say, This ain't right. Yeah. And preach the truth. He was out there a few minutes ago talking with another preacher. He was talking about the, uh, uh, the grace preachers and all that stuff. Uh, hey, man, I'm, uh, thank God for grace. <laughs> but it's not what they're preaching. You didn't become sinless when you got saved. And you didn't become irresponsible about sin when you got saved. But he was saying because he preached repentance in one of, these, one of these churches, everybody got mad at him and told him not to come back. Except you repent, you perish, the Bible says. Twice Jesus said that. So when the wicked rise up, it's not time to shut your mouth and turn and walk away. It's not time to cower down. It's time to stand. Take a stand. We shouldn't flee when our imagination gets carried away. Uh, look at Nehemiah. Put your marker there in Psalm. We'll come back to that. Look back at Nehemiah backwards. Psalm, Job, Esther, Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 6. It's not time to flee when your imagination gets running away with you. And it'll do that when troubles are, are surrounding you. You'll get, to, you'll get filled with vain imagination. You'll get to inventing things that are not even happening. Nehemiah 6 verse 10. Not time to flee. When you're uh, having all these wild thoughts about things. Nehemiah, chapter 6, verse 10. Afterward I, Nehemiah, came unto the house of Shemaiah, the son of Eliah, the son of Mahedabiel, uh, who was uh, shut up. And he said, uh, Shemaiah said, Let us meet together, you and, you and me, Nehemiah, in the house of God within the temple, and let us shut the doors of the temple, for they will come to slay thee. You ever wonder who they are? You know, they said and they say. And, who, who in the world are they? For they will come to slay thee, yea, in the night will they come to slay thee. And look at Nehemiah. And I said, Should such a man as I please. And who is there that being as I am would go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. Nehemiah is surrounded by enemies that send ballot to buy and get him and, and uh, all, those, all that crowd there. And they're after him. But nowhere does the text even indicate that they tried to kill him or plotted to kill him or anything like that. They're always trying to overthrow his work and, and uh, discredit him and all that kind of stuff and tell him rumors about it. But nowhere does it say they were plotting to kill him. And yet this guy, this guy is a tool of the devil here. And he comes to Nehemiah and he said, Hey, they're plotting to kill you. They're going to come tonight and kill you. And the only safety is to go in the temple and hide yourself. The devil's using this man to get Nehemiah out of the will of God. And Nehemiah said, I'm in my place. I'm where God put me. And uh, the enemy is out there. And they may do me harm, but I'm going to stand where God put me. And I'm going to do what God put me here to do. And I'm not going to flee. Should such a man as I. That's what we all ought to say. You're a child of God, aren't you? Should a child of the king flee from the enemy? Don't you realize the devil's a defeated foe? Don't you realize he can't do anything to you unless God gives him permission to do that? You don't have to run. But that's what they try to get Nehemiah to do. Look at John chapter 10. It's not time to flee when others' lives are at stake, when souls are hanging in the balance. I'm going to tell you, a lot of preachers, they'll throw in the towel and quit because of somebody's gossip or somebody uh, plotting against them, all this kind of stuff, and they'll quit and leave souls hanging in the balance. Let me tell you something, preacher. If God does call you to resign your church and go somewhere else, you still got a responsibility to see that that plot that God put in your care is going to be taken care of. You got a responsibility to see that you are replaced. And but whatever this worth to you, pulpit committees are not the answer. Why? Ain't nobody in the congregation got the sense of God to fill the pulpit. That's the Holy Spirit's job. God calls preachers, not pulpit committees. Therefore, if you resign your church, it's your responsibility to see that a man of like faith and practice comes in that pulpit behind you, or those sheep are going to hurt for it. 
I see churches where the preacher leaves off and the church flounders around a couple of years. They've got no preacher. And what, what invariably happens when that takes place is the wolves rise up in the congregation and take over. And then when another man of God comes in, he can't deal with it. He can't do anything with it. It's messed up. I don't know how I got on that, but, but it's not time to run. It's not time to run when souls are in the balance. We have responsibilities. John 10, verse 12, But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose uh, own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep. A lot of preachers resign their churches because troubles come on their churches instead of standing up, taking charge, and dealing with the problem. They'll pack up and leave town. Thank God for good missionaries. But I'm telling you what, there's a lot of missionaries out there that should have stayed in their pulpit back home. They ran from their problems. Well, I just think God's called me to the mission field. God hasn't called you anywhere when a problem's going on. Except to deal with the trouble and straighten it out. So the Lord says, He says He sees the wolf coming, He leaves the sheep and fleeth. And the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth because he is an hireling and careth not for the sheep. You see, the man who runs, he only cares about himself. Self-preservation. He's looking out for number one. Back in the Vietnam fiasco that our nation refused to call a war, so it was a conflict, Hey, man, when, when 70,000 of our own people get, get uh, slaughtered on the battlefield, that sounds like a war to me. There was a young uh, Marine lieutenant, Lieutenant Bobo. And one day he took his squad out on patrol, and uh, they got pinned down by the enemy. And they were in a bad fix there. And a shell came in and blew one of Lieutenant Bobo's legs off. And uh, he knew he had his responsibility for his men. And the story goes that he jammed that stub of a leg down in the mud to try to control the bleeding a little bit, told his men, he said, as many weapons as you can spare, lay within arm's reach, put as much ammo as you can and put in front of me. And he told his squad how to get out and how to escape and sent them off. And uh, he stayed behind while the Viet Cong was coming up the hill. And they say that later on when the helicopters went in, there was Lieutenant Bobo. He was dead. There were spent shells all around him. There were dead Viet Cong laying all around him. Here's the rest of the story. There was a man named Gary Britton on that hill with Lieutenant Bobo. Gary Britton got off because the lieutenant stayed, stood in the gap, held off the enemy while they got away. Gary Britton came back after his tour of duty, got back to the United States, got saved, got called to the mission field. Now he's down in South America winning people to Jesus Christ because somebody stood where they were supposed to stand because souls were in the balance. God has saved many, many souls because Lieutenant Bobo stood his ground and stayed where he was supposed to stay for the protection of his men. And the uh, uh, preacher, you've got a job to protect your sheep. The Bible says we're supposed to watch for their souls. And we'll give account to God for that. That's why James 3, 1 says, you've got the greater condemnation, preacher. You've got the responsibility. A bunch of newsmen asked uh, Douglas MacArthur one time, they said, who's the greatest general uh, uh, as far as you know, Mr. MacArthur? And he said, the greatest general I've ever known and ever ever seen was Walker. Well, a lot of those Jews, they never heard of any General Walker. They said, what, what makes him so uh, great in your sight? And uh, uh, MacArthur said, because I saw him in retreat, and he didn't have a mob, he had an army. The only time you retreat, child of God, when the enemy shows up, is to get a better position. Yep. And then you don't, you don't lose control of what's going on when you're retreating. You keep control of everything that's happening in order to get a better position to fight the enemy better. That's the only time you retreat. Only time you back up. None of us live it to himself. We've got other people we're responsible for. Right. Hey, Dad, don't bail out because everything falls apart at your house. You've got a responsibility to that wife and kid. Stand, yeah. stay by the stuff. Right. Number one, refuse to flee. Number two, rebuild the foundation. He said in verse 3, back in chapter 11, 
Verse 3, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? In other words, David said, don't let these foundations be destroyed. We've got to have something to stand on. It looks like it's all over. Instead of giving up and quitting, the rubble went back and rebuilt the foundation. And that's what we're supposed to do. Look at Ezra chapter 3. Go back to Ezra. Backwards, Esther, Nehemiah, Ezra chapter 3. Rebuild what's been destroyed. Sometimes the enemy is going to destroy things. Rebuild it. Ezra 3, verse 8. Now in the second year of their coming into the, into the house of God in Jerusalem in the second month, began Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, uh, the son of Josedach, and the remnant of the of their brethren, the priests, and Levites, and all they that were come out of the captivity unto Jerusalem, and appointed the Levites, uh, and so forth, to set forward the work of the house. Notice it says, all they that were come out of the captivity. I'll tell you one thing that will encourage you to rebuild foundations is when you get sick and tired of being in captivity. You get sick and tired of the enemy on your back 24 hours a day. You get sick and tired of problem, problems and troubles uh, around you all the day long, every day. And when you get sick and tired of it, you're going to stand up and do something about it. And you're going to say, I've had enough of this, and I'm not going to put up with this anymore, and I'm going to rebuild these foundations that the devil's coming here and trying to tear up. He'll try to destroy your church. He'll try to destroy your home. If you get sick and tired of that, he'll set up and do something about it. Let me just tell you a secret. God's not going to do everything for you. He gives us the wherewithal to do some things ourselves. Jesus came to the tomb. He said, you guys roll the stone away and then I'll call the dead body out. Rebuild the foundation. You know, that's what's wrong with our country. Our country's not sick and tired of its condition yet. If it ever gets sick and tired of its condition, we're going to see some things happen. Yeah. Just like back in the Revolutionary War, people got sick and tired of what was going on. When it, when it gets to that point, one of two things is going to happen in your church or in a country, either revival or revolution. Uh, it was revival under Hezekiah and Asa. It was revolution under Jehu. But one of the others is going to happen when people get sick and tired of what's going on. Look at verse 9 here in Ezra chapter 3. Then stood Yeshua with his sons and his brethren, and uh, it names them all, and said they stood up to do the work and get the job done. When you get, to, when you get sick and tired of captivity, you've got to have some leadership. You've got to have somebody stand up and say, this is the way we need to go and lead either the church or the family or whatever it is in the direction it's supposed to go. Some leadership. Some of you husbands need to learn what leadership means. It means taking charge of the family. It doesn't mean being, being the town bully. It means taking charge of the family and leading your wife and kids in the ways of righteousness. That's what it means. Sometimes that's a great problem to rebuilding foundations. You can't find anybody who wants to lead. You can't find anybody who wants to take charge. Why? Because there's great responsibilities involved in taking charge. Look at verse 10. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set the priests in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with symbols to praise the Lord after the ordinance of David, king of Israel. Uh, let me tell you a little secret. Music will greatly encourage you to rebuild the foundation. When things are not going right at the house, and things are not going right at the church, wherever, I'm telling you what, you get some good gospel music, you get some music that glorifies the Lord, and you get listening to that, in a few minutes you'll be back glorifying the Lord. It'll get you out of your mully grub. And get your mind cleared up, get your mind off the problem, so you can see the thing the way it really is, and do something about it. Verse, uh, uh, one, of, one, of the, one of the screwball looking things in history, to me, is when Great Britain used to go into battle back before this century. You know how they always went to battle? They had a bunch of bagpipers out in the front. Yeah. Going to bagpipe, and they're marching right in the face of the enemy, and a, a, a bagpiper gets shot, he falls down, unless I don't move, man, they just keep playing, marching right. Hey, Britain never lost any wars until this century. Right. That was the same tactic that Jehoshaphat used against the Syrians. It said he put the choir out in front. He put the singers in the forefront, singing and praising God, and God gave the victory. I'm telling you, music, the right music will give you the victory. God will get in there. God will stir you up, and God will get you above the circumstance. And then you can do what you're supposed to do. Look at verse 11. 
And they sang together by chorus in praising and giving thanks unto the Lord because He is good for His mercy endureth forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. They rebuilt, they got the job done, and then they could stand back and shout and give God the glory for it. And that's exactly what they did. You don't quit when the foundations get destroyed. You just rebuild them. You just rebuild them. Uh, listen, uh, I, I don't know if anything like this would ever happen, but if a lightning bolt came in here and just tore this concrete all up, you don't just nail a for sale sign up there and go back to town. You scrape the junk out of the way and you rebuild it. You rebuild the foundations whenever they get destroyed, whenever the enemy messes up with it. And it, sometimes it will. Hey, if your home's falling apart, rebuild it. If your testimony's shot, rebuild it. It might take a long time, but when you get done, you can shout the victory and God will move in the house and bless you. Rebuild the foundation. And then let me say thirdly, not only refuse to flee, not only rebuild the foundation, but remember your Father. Remember your Father in heaven. Verse 4. Psalm 11, verse 4. The Lord is in His holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold. He sees what's going on. His eyelids try the children of men. David wondered where God was. He said in chapter 10, verse 1, God, why are you so afar off? But even though David couldn't see God, God was watching David. God saw everything that was going on. He knew the whole problem. He saw the big picture. He knew where David was. He knew what David was going through. He, knew, he knows exactly what's going on in your life, your little corner of the world. He knows all about it. Psalm 142, verse 3, When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then thou knewest my path. He knows your problem. He has not abandoned you. He might be just doing like he did Hezekiah, just backing up a little bit to see what you're going to do. If you're going to stay right with him. But He knows where you are. He knows what you're going through. Verse 5, The Lord trieth the righteous. What He did to Hezekiah. Verse 6, Upon the wicked He shall rain snare, fire, and brimstone in a horrible tempest. Verse 7, For the righteous Lord loveth righteous. Those three verses tell you He's seeing everything that's going on. All that's happening with the wicked. All that's happening with the righteous. He knows exactly where you are, child of God. He knows exactly what your trouble is. And He has not abandoned you even if you can't find Him. God does still, as the song says, have everything under control. Yeah. He is still in charge. He is still sovereign. And you know what? We've got to misunderstand about this, this thing of sovereignty. We say, why? Why doesn't God do such and such? Why doesn't God intervene? Why does, you, you say things like, God could change this if He wanted to. You just define sovereignty. Sovereignty is not, the sovereignty of God is not that God controls everything all the time. The sovereignty of God is that God can control everything anytime He wants to. And there is a difference. Sometimes He's going to let you go through the fire. He could put out the fire. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. Why doesn't God do something about this? I'll tell you why not. He doesn't want to yet. Why? Because He's sovereign. He'll do something about it when He gets good and ready. And it'll be the right time. And if you stay right with Him until He gets good and ready to straighten out your situation, if you'll stay right with Him, then you can shout the victory at the other end. If not, you're going to be ashamed of yourself. Ashamed of yourself. When you can't find God, trust Him anyway. Stay right anyway. Refuse to flee. Rebuild the broken foundation. Remember God is there. God's aware of what's going on, whether you can find Him or not. Let's bow our heads for this as you know. That all right, people? Somebody come up and play something, please. I don't know where you are. I know a lot went to the altar last night over things in their lives, but we're not. this is not last night, this is this morning. Where are you at in your family? Where are you at in your Christian walk? Are you trusting the Lord? Where are you preaching in your church? Churches have a lot of problems. 
I had a family leave my church just about three weeks ago. No real reason. The, the dumb thing he gave me, just an excuse. And uh, we preachers, that grieves us when we see things like that happen. It grieves us. I hate to see anybody leave, especially with something dumb. Because uh, I know they're walking, they're stepping out of the will of God. That's going to hurt them. It's going to hurt their family. This man has four or five children that love God. He's going to hurt his family if he's not real careful. And we don't like things like that. It grieves us. Well, what are you going to do? You're going to stay right anyway. You're going to keep serving the Lord anyway. I mean, if the church splits right down the middle and two-thirds of them leave, you're going to stay right with God anyway. You're going to rebuild the foundation. Who are you this morning? What about it, preacher? Everything right in your little vineyard? What about it, Daddy? Everything right in your house? Time to rebuild. Time to take a stand. I can't find God. That's what I came to tell me for, to find God. You might not even find Him here. Do right anyway. If you need to come this morning, y'all be open. Sometimes we can't find it.